Well, hello again, everybody. Well, I took a short trip back to Narnia and uh, recovered this speaker, which you saw in part one of the video. Um, I don't know if this is the right speaker for the set. It seems to roughly fit the dimensions for the baffle board, but I think perhaps it isn't because uh, this baffle board has got these clips on it here, which are designed to clamp the speaker down. Whereas I can see that it's got this fabric guard around the speaker and the screw holes through it. So I don't think this is the uh, the right speaker for it, but it's one of them things that uh, needs must. It's actually the only speaker I've got and uh, actually about the only output transformer I've got to hand. Now, output transformers are kind of dedicated to the, uh, the output stage of the valve to do with the uh, anode resistance and all good stuff like that. The only other problem I see though is that this speaker shows quite a lot of signs of damage. I'm just taking the uh, Turing shroud off it at the moment uh, to have a better look at it because I don't even know if this speaker is going to be any good or not. And if it is a bad speaker I'm afraid that uh, rain may entirely stop play because I, I don't have another one. You know unwrapping this cloth feels a little bit like unwrapping a mummy and I'm not talking about any kind of MILF action here. I'm expecting a, maybe a mouse or a, to jump out at me. Ugh. Very dirty and dusty. Let's turn the speaker over. So, uh, yeah, the first thing we see is we see a great big rip in the speaker cone. Unfortunately, it does go right up to the, uh, the spider in the voice coil. So that's actually quite badly damaged. But again, comes back to needs must. If we've got to glue that together with some... Uh, copy dex glue or whatever that's what we'll have to do but what I'm more worried about is actually the uh, the state of the output transformer here in that I can actually see that it's got like silicon rubber on it which certainly isn't original so somebody has been in here and uh, tried to do some kind of repair in the past and we've also got um, one of the windings of the transformer broken off and it doesn't just look broken it actually looks as though it's burnt off so that's certainly that's that's really not a good sign at all that's that's quite a worrying outcome so these two leads I've got here these just come down from my signal generator on the shelf and the signal generator is set to deliver a one kilohertz sine wave at 10 volts peak to peak so I'm fairly sure that these two connections on the top of the transformer I think they might be going into the uh, the voice coil so uh, yeah, I think they come down there so let's just connect onto the voice coil and see if we get any action so that's a good sign we do actually get something so the only other connections we've got on here are these uh these transformer connections and uh like i say this one really worries me because it looks as though it could be burnt out not sure if you can see there but we've just got a wire that's broken off from somewhere but it doesn't just look broken it actually looks this wire actually looks as though it's burnt at the end so that's a really worrying sign Ooh, that was all a bit wibbly wobbly I'm afraid so these two connections here these are going to be a combination of both our voice coil and our output transformer windings uh, 3.2 ohms I would actually expect it to be a little bit lower than that because just the voice coil is probably around 3 ohms but that's what I'm pretty sure that's what they are I think they, uh, those connections go to the bottom down here somewhere. Let's do double check that, we should get a similar reading. Yeah, about 3.2. So I'm hoping that one of these other three windings is going to be the input to our transformer. So we're getting nothing on that one. Nothing on that one. So we've actually got a connection one ohm here yeah. so let's try on our end one got nothing there let's go one in to the one we've just soldered on got nothing there let's go between the two on the end yep 
Yeah, that says 34 meg ohm, that's not right. Again, that's just dampness, that's uh, that's open circuited. So, um, a little bit of a fail now. I actually don't know what to do. Because um, I don't think I've got another output transformer anywhere. I'm just going to take this transformer off if I can get it off. It's just held on by a, a metal tab that you can just usually just twist these and get them off. I'm just going to take it off and we're going to have a, just another look, close look at the transformer when it's off. Just double check that there isn't something like a, you know, a little tab, a little bit of exposed wire we can, um, you know, we can get at. Because sometimes you get lucky and there is. Now, as I said, hopefully we can uh, reuse this uh, speaker if we can just find another output transformer for it. So we'll be taking a look at that later, I should think. Let's just see if the uh, the secondary of this transformer was okay. One ohm. So I think that was the secondary. So this must have been the primary here. Yeah, 25 meg. That, that just isn't right. It shouldn't be 25 meg. So you can see that this transformer had previously suffered some damage on it and it was already badly dented and scuffed. So um, yeah, I think this was destroyed long before it came into my hands because the uh, the primary winding is definitely open circuit on it. The secondary seems to be okay but the yeah the prim primary is OC. So uh, nothing we can do with that I'm afraid. Um, just a complete fail there. So now we've disconnected the secondary of the audio output transformer from the voice coil of the speaker, we can go ahead and we can just measure the uh, the speaker's voice coil resistance, and that's uh, that's about 2.4 ohms. So if we multiply that by 1.3, as a rule of thumb, that'll give us the impedance. So that's going to come out about 3.2 ohms. That was the secondary winding I actually just removed there because it's actually a thicker one because obviously there's a lot more current flows through the secondary in the speaker than it does actually in the anode of the valve. I was hoping I could just uh, pull this winding off. Sometimes you can get these uh, Cores out. This one does seem a little bit tight. I'm sure, I can just get one moving, I'll be fine. Let's see if we can just knock one out. <laughs> I'm sure, I have gloves on really. The problem with these windings is they get really sharp. And uh, first injury, like I say, <laughs> cut myself. Yeah, you should put gloves on when you do that. These windings are just, these, uh, sorry, it's the laminations, they're just dead sharp on these things. Well, unfortunately, a little bit of a fail. Tried to unwind this audio transformer, but unfortunately, the uh, windings on the primary, the anode side, they're just far too thin, and as soon as I touch them, they just come apart, they break apart. Um, but we do know that they were open circuited because we tested it with the uh, with the ohm meter before. So sometimes these things happen; they tend to uh, they tend to burn out. That's the one that will go because the as you can see, the secondary windings are a lot heavier. This is the secondary stuff here, which is on the speaker side, because these obviously these carry a lot more current. Whereas in theory, the actual anode current for the uh, output valve it's only somewhere in the lines of four milliamps. 
but um, yeah a lot of voltage there and uh, they are such thin windings that they just tend to burn out very easily so that's what's happened so as you can see we've got our old speaker here and uh, I'm afraid it has got a pretty good tear in it which goes right from the uh, suspension all the way to the uh, to the spider in the middle and uh, I'm actually just wondering if I should actually take the uh, the central spider support out and uh, try and repair it from there. I don't think I will at this point because uh, I'm not exactly confident in uh, recentering everything, and um, I think it might be better just to stabilise the rip here first, and then if necessary, maybe uh, go ahead and remove this part and. Uh, patch it up. So here in the UK this Copydex glue is quite available and it's what I'm going to use. The reason I'm going to actually use it is that it actually dries with a, a very rubbery consistency so it does stretch and move. Now unfortunately because this rip really is just so large I think we're going to have to get something to bridge across it. Again I've asked around and various people have said uh, they use tissue paper. I know some people use the, uh, the filters from uh, filter coffee machines. This is what I'm going to use and it's almost like what I call tracing paper in the UK. It's kind of quite a thin tissue paper and uh, it's what you get in things like shoe boxes and stuff like that or fancy goods sometimes come wrapped in it. So I've also gone ahead and I've stolen from the kitchen one of these pan scrubbing sponges and it had an abrasive side which I've torn off and that's just leaving with a bit of foam because uh, I didn't have any foam. So what I think I need to do is uh, I'm not going to be able to bridge this because not only has it ripped, the uh, the cone has deformed and it's kind of dipping away. So I have tried and sometimes you can get the pieces to uh, just overlap slightly and stay together but the slightest touch in it has a habit of popping back inside. So what I'm going to try to do is I think we need to give it a little bit of support. So I'm hoping that I can just tear up some of these bits of foam and actually just jam them in the back so I'm just working uh, I'm just working a piece of that foam up inside the uh, the speaker between the metal framework here and the uh, the diaphragm cone and I'm I'm just hoping that we can just uh, just push this piece of cone material forward a little bit. I think I almost had it then, not quite. Yeah, can't quite make my mind up. Very, very brittle this. I think even as I'm touching it, it's kind of breaking apart a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take some of this copy decks. I'm going to put a blob in here. And I'm going to try and uh, just put a drip of water into it, a couple of drips. Am I about to get a drip with that? That's okay, that looks okay. And I'm going to mix it up. So I'm just watering the glue down a little bit. Now we might have to uh, go ahead and glue this twice. So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to take my artist brush and uh, I'm actually just going to wet the speaker cone with this uh, with this glue. And uh, because it's thin like this, it's actually going to soak into the cone. I can actually see it's yeah, it's ripped there as well, isn't it? So I'm just going to uh, going to paint this on. And I'm not really going to do any more than just paint it on, and uh, it will soak in. And hopefully what this will do, it will soak into the paper and it will uh, it'll just reinforce it. And it will also be a, like a kind of a bit of a primer coat for the other layers of uh, tissue paper that we're going to put on it afterwards. Just notice another little tear there, so I'll just put a dot on there to reinforce it. Actually, every time I, I look I find another tear, there's another tear there as well. And I'm afraid it doesn't really get any more exciting than that. I'm just going to leave that now. I'm going to let that dry and then I'm going to come back later and I'm going to try and patch it up. Well, it's about an hour later now, so I'm just going to take some more of our glue. And what I'm going to try to do is uh, 
I'm going to try and put our uh, patch piece on. Again, I'm certainly not claiming any expertise here. I've, I've done this job kind of a couple of times, but um, yeah, I'm no expert. But I don't think this is exactly uh, rocket science, really. It's not rocket science, but it is fiddler. Now I'm not sure exactly how many pieces of paper you're meant to use to try to uh, reinforce this with. I'm guessing it depends how thick your paper is. I think I'm just going to put another patch on top of the first one for good measure. Whether it needs it or not, who can tell. Well I think while we wait for the glue to dry on our speak, we may as well do something else. And I think doing something else consists of having a look at the output transformer or basically the problem that we've got with it. Now clearly the output transformer isn't something that we can repair. So what we're actually going to have to do is actually go and have a rummage through the junk box and see if we can find an old output transformer that will suit our needs. So let's have a quick look at our circuit. So this is our output valve here and this is a, a 220 HPT and that's an output pentode valve. Now the thing about valves is that they're high voltage devices. They actually don't usually pass a huge amount of current so they work with high voltage and low current. Whereas we've actually got a speaker here. This is our speaker here that needs to make all our sound. Actually speakers can be relatively high current devices so we've probably only got a few volts across our speaker but we've certainly got a lot more current. And we took a measurement of the speaker impedance before didn't we? And we found that that was somewhere in the region of about 3 ohms which would be typical for a set of this age. And unfortunately because our valve is such a high impedance device it isn't going to match very easily to the low impedance of the speaker. So that's where the job of the audio output transformer comes in here. It actually transforms the low impedance of the speaker to a high impedance of the valve plate. So of course we can relatively easily find out what the impedance is of our loudspeaker but unfortunately it's not necessarily that easy to work out the output impedance of our valve. But luckily the people who make valves gave us a bit of a hint so let's have a look at a data sheet for our output valve. So here is a data sheet for our output valve and it says here that the 220HPT is a pento valve that will give a generous output for a very small value of high tension current. Well that's going to be ideal for our battery set isn't it? Because we can only draw a limited amount of current from our dry cell batteries. So we need a valve that really isn't going to pass too much current. So if we scroll down through the data sheet I'm going to find the bit that we actually want. So hopefully for most valve data sheets will give you this value here. This is the optimum load and this is giving you an idea what that plate impedance will be. That's what it looks like and it's kind of an average value because the actual load impedance of the valve changes all the time as the voltage and the current changes across it and in fact the frequency. So what that data sheet is telling us is that our valve here it actually wants to see a resistance across here across our output transformer of about 17,000 ohms. So we're going to have 17,000 ohms on this side but we're going to only going to have 3 ohms on this side. So we need something which is going to transform that impedances and that's the job of the output transformer. So now we actually know the value of the uh, load impedance and actually the impedance of our speak here we can do some calculation and what we need to work out is what the turns ratio of our transformer is because we're going to have to rummage through the junk box and try and find something appropriate. So having just spoken about our output pentode valve and how we can use an output transformer to actually match the optimum load impedance of the output valve to our speaker, I thought it was worth talking a little bit more about loudspeakers. So when you see the impedance printed on the back of a loudspeaker it might be something like 4 ohms. Well what that 4 ohms is telling you, the manufacturers are telling you that the actual impedance of the speaker won't be less than 4 ohms over its rated bandwidth it could actually be considerably more than 4 ohms so the chart that you can see here is not untypical so what we've got here we've got impedance plotted on the vertical scale here and then we've actually got the frequency up to 10 kilohertz plotted on the bottom 
So if we just go along here, you can actually see at the lower frequencies, we've actually got a peak of impedance here. At, uh, it's about 13 ohms, and that's for our 4 ohm speaker. So that's really, you know, that's quite a lot above the specification. But we're not really particularly listening to much at 30 hertz, are we? If we actually go along to the 75 uh, hertz, we can actually see it actually peaks here at 17 ohms. But then when we come into what I'm guessing the manufacturers would call the usable part of the bandwidth, and it's particularly usable if you're somebody like me, you probably can't hear above 10 kilohertz anyway. You can see the output is, is relatively flat. So you can actually see that we have got these peaks and impedances here. And it's worth mentioning that these peaks of impedance will actually be reflected back to the anode of our valve. The anode load on our valve is the impedance is actually varying all the time with the frequency response. Don't get too strung out about measuring absolutely accurate values of speaker impedances because it's somewhat of a movable feast. Now having just said that the impedance of the speaker varies by quite a lot, typically it will be specified at 1 kilohertz. So that's one of the reasons why it's really not a lot of use trying to measure the DC resistance just using a, a volt ohm meter. But what you can use is something like the piece of equipment that I'm using here which is something called an AC bridge. Now what the impedance bridge will let me do is not only will it measure the DC resistance very accuracy, it will actually measure the AC impedance using a 1 kilohertz sine wave and it'll do that very very accurately. Well whenever I operate this impedance bridge I always think it's a cross between foreplay and uh, taking a pair of bent coat hangers and walking around the garden looking for water. You're never exactly sure about the results and actually trying to get a deep null on the meter isn't easy. But I did go ahead and do that and I've measured the impedance of our speaker as 2.2 ohms. Now I also went ahead and I very accurately measured the DC resistance of it and that came out as about 1.75 ohms. Now interestingly enough you can use the rule of thumb which I mentioned earlier. So if you actually just take the DC resistance which in our case was about 1.7 and you multiply that by this 1.3 it actually will give you a rough approximation of the speaker's impedance and again that comes out as 2.2 ohms. But I'm sure we could have just gone ahead and guessed and used our figure of 3 ohms and it wouldn't have made a huge amount of difference. So, uh, so we've got our three transformers here and what we need to know is if any of these transformers have got the turns ratio that, that we're looking for which is about 87 to 1. And the way we're going to do that is uh, we're going to work out the voltage ratio between the primary side and the secondary side and if you know what the uh, the voltage ratio is you can if you know what the difference in voltage is sorry you just divide one number by the other and that will give you the uh, the turns ratio um, I'm actually going to inject a signal into the secondary of one volt if you use a figure of one volt the advantage of that is it's direct reading you don't need to do any maths so for example if we put one volt here and we measure 20 volts in our primary it's very simple then the uh, the turns ratio is 20 to 1 if we put Put 1 volt and get 30 out it's 30 to 1 so you don't actually start dividing different voltage levels and stuff like that. Now when a lot of people do this test they actually use as their signal source they use a, a Variac a variable transformer and I would probably use one of them as well but unfortunately I've left mine at work so I don't have it to use. Um, so I'm going to choose this uh, transformer first for no other reason than it's uh, it looks in fairly good condition and uh, if it's if it's good that that'll be the one we'll install i can't actually remember which was the secondary and the primary on here so i just need to double check that so between terminals 1 and 4 we're getting about 0.5 and ohm which is actually lower than i was expecting but that's going to be the secondary that's going to be the heavy winding which is uh, going to the speaker normally so i'm guessing 2 and 3 is going to be our primary which is 355 ohm, which is what I would about what I would expect. Kind of hoping we haven't got a shorted turn on that one. So I'm actually going to wire this up backwards. I'm going to inject a signal into the uh, secondary side. So I need to connect up terminals 1 and 4, which is that one, and that one. And now I'm going to set up our reference voltage of 1 volt. Okay, 1.016 volts. So that's uh, 
that's what we've got there. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to move these over now to the primary side and we're going to get a step up effect so we're expecting to see a lot more voltage. We've got one volt on here I'm expecting to see a lot more voltage on the primary. We've got 44 volts out for one volt in so that makes the turns ratio very easy to work out that's 44 to 1. I'm going to turn that off. And I'm just going to write that on the side of here because once I've done it I'll keep it for the future 44 for 1 and uh, that's that one done. So, so, so for this transformer we're getting 67 volts out so for 1 volt in we're getting 67 volts out so the, uh, the ratio there is uh, 67 to 1. So finally I'm just going to test this transformer for MRS components and uh, I've got a data sheet for this but I've not got it in front of me but I have determined what the primary and secondary is but because this is multi-tapped it's got a number of different windings we could go at so what I've actually chosen for the secondary I've chosen the fewest number of windings which is this set of tappings here and then we're going to measure a number of different voltages and I'm going to be looking for the highest voltages because that's going to be the highest uh, turns ratio that we're going to be looking for. So let me just check what our input is. Ah, 1.03 volts, good enough. Right, okay, so our first voltage tapping's across there. 25 volts, let's see what we can get a bit more. 49 volts, let's go for the final one. 88 volts. Okay, so this one's got a ratio for this tapping arrangement that we've got set up here of 88 to 1. So going back to our little crib sheet, we actually said that we wanted a turns ratio of 87 to 1. So it looks like this RS transformer is going to come up absolutely trumps for us. So all we've got to do now is figure out a way of fitting it onto this uh, speaker. And I think that will look and work really well. I'm going to go ahead and do that off camera. So uh, I think really this is about a logical place to stop here. So until next time, well, thanks very much for watching as always. I think that'll do. I'll see you again very soon. Bye bye for now. <laughs>